Okay, tonight's topic is dirty money and synagogue fundraising. Oh. And do you have approval to? And I do not have approval to talk about this. No, um, <laughs> definitely not. It's a good thing in the program. Basically, we got to these partios about the the building of the mishkan, the building of the tabernacle, and I was thinking, what are we going to do? So there there are. In, I didn't want to get too much into the to the mishkan itself. I don't. I think that's difficult to spend a long time on. Um, maybe next week we'll, we will do a little bit more directly Mishkan related, but the topic of truma, the part is called truma, which is the term used for donations. There are a lot of different discussions about what that means. Truma is actually a Torah, Tafva, Reish, Hay, with a man. The same letters. It's like what the Torah was given, uh, Moshe was on the Harsinai for 40 days. And basically, the notion, the idea of, of donations starts here with the donations for the for the base make dust for the for the building of the Mishkan and that I guess will be the beginning of this discussion about um, money. Are there extra copies? We I think there should be over here. No there there, sorry. Um, okay, so so the Torah in the Parsha the Parsha opens by Daber Shama Mochelling more Daber al Bene Sir Elvia Kli Truma speak to the people of Israel and take for me Truma. May Ace Kalish Asher Yidven will be to Kulas Truma. See, for every person whose heart inspires him, you shall take Truma. You shall take a donation from each person. I saw something very interesting, which I still want to focus on. I want to look into a little bit more. But if you look at Rashi comments here, Asher Yidven will be someone whose heart inspires him. Lashon Nidava, Rashi says, it's an expression of donation. Lashon Ratzon Tov, it's an expression of good intention. So Rashi says that's what the Torah is driving at here, not that anyone who has money should fork it over, but that people who are inspired by the notion of building a Mishkan, they should be involved in the process. So I saw someone mention that there are, there's an obligation here only on those who are interested. It's a very uh, fascinating phenomenon. If you're interested, if you believe in the notion of a Mishkan, you see its value. You're inspired to give, you have to give. And if you're not interested, if you don't see the purpose, there's no chiyuv, no obligation whatsoever. Which is a very interesting idea. We have a notion, and maybe there's more to develop here. We have a notion, Ga'adol ha-metsuva va'osa v'misha eno metsuva va'osa. A person who is, who is obligated in a commandment is on a higher level than someone who just does it because they feel like it. Uh, the, the, the Talmud actually has a story about a certain, a certain rabbi who was of the opinion that someone who's blind is not obligated in mitzvot. The status of someone who's blind in halacha is, is it, and practically we assume that they are obligated, but there was an opinion that they weren't obligated. So this rabbi was blind, and he said to his students, he wanted to throw a party, literally, throw a party, why? Because he discovered that someone who's blind is not obligated in mitzvot. So they said, well, so why do you want to throw a party? So he said, well, I'm not obligated in mitzvot because I'm blind. And I do just as many mitzvot as everyone else. So if I'm not obligated and I'm doing more than you, that's pretty impressive. So I must be getting tremendous reward, so I'm going to throw a big party. So he further uh, analyzed the topic, and then he realized that he was not excused from all the mitzvot, and he was very sad. And then his Talmudim said to him, God will have a and we should aim a Better to be obligated in the mitzvah. Do it because it's what God wants from you, what God expects from you, than to do it because it's something you expect of yourself. So here we have this interesting idea that if you're interested in the mitzvah, if you're inspired, if you want to participate, then you become chayim. So that's just something to think about. But when it comes to the topic of dirty money or tainted funds, whatever you want to call it, so I think this is a very interesting uh, model for practical applications of Jewish law. And the reason I say that is because the sources, at least the sources that I've come across, don't address this topic in the, in the way that we'd want it to. There's so many variables that come into applying this to our synagogues and our Jewish organizations and the people that are donating money to our causes there's so many variables that are involved that 
finding out exactly how these sources would play out practically is very difficult. So we'll try and discuss a number of the variables that come up in these issues and a number of areas in halacha where this was addressed and there we can get at least a little bit of a sense of how to grapple with this question maybe philosophically and maybe ethically and practically. So first of all, when you're talking about the question of fundraising, so I would pose the, my first question is how much investigation do the fundraisers have to do? If you're raising funds for an organization, if you take money from anybody who's willing to give, instinctively you would think so. And maybe practically that's how it happens. As people, I don't think anyone in this room is involved in fundraising, I don't know, but I'm not involved in fundraising for the Jewish organization, so it's very easy for me to say you shouldn't take from this person, you shouldn't take from that person. But when big checks come in, it's hard to turn them down. But do you have a responsibility to do that? Do you have to look into where your checks are coming from? That's question number one. Maybe as a caveat to that, we have a notion of being down the cops close that you're supposed to assume that people are good people. So that would be the best fallback. I'm not sure who that person is, but it's my responsibility as a good Jew, right? I mean, to judge him fairly. Why should I assume that he's a criminal? Okay, so that's point number one. You have to judge the same way as if you were giving him money? Maybe. The question you might not be as likely to judge him, right. perhaps. Question number two is what do we do, as we say in the yeshiva, bidiyat? Ex post facto. They donate money to your synagogue, and as a result, you put their name in big letters on the wall of the shul. And then after their name gets put on the wall of the shul, their face is on the cover of the New York Times. So now what do you do? In the post office. Right, they, right they're up in the post office. So what do you do? So, so now what do you do? Do you give the money back? Do you keep the money but take the name down? Or do you just ignore it and say, listen, that was then and this is now? Not an easy question. Question number three is let's say you know for sure the person is involved in illegal activities, criminal activities, activities that are non-moral. And now they want to make a donation. And maybe that's where they're getting their money from. So do you have to say no? We have a notion of mitzvah haba ba'avera, doing a mitzvah that comes about through doing an Avera, which is prohibited. But that doesn't necessarily technically apply in every situation. If a person robs someone else and takes their item and sells the item and now has the money from the stolen item, the money's not tainted. If you take that money, you can buy a lulav and you'll fulfill your mitzvah on sukkahs. So, there will be the technical obstacle. Is it considered a mitzvah to give money to these organizations? And is it technically a mitzvah above Bavera? Maybe not. Maybe you can get around it. It's a, few, it's a few steps removed, but we still have that notion in the back of our minds. So we feel guilty about letting this person donate, accepting the money, being involved in that kind of activity. And the final point, which I hope we'll get to, is the, maybe the difference between where the money is going. Is there a possibility to distinguish between if they're giving money to the Federation to build a swimming pool, it doesn't concern me so much where the money came from, but if they want to write a safer Torah, if they want to build a shul, maybe the base HaKnesses, maybe the shul is on, has a higher standard of expectation, and we'll get to one opinion that actually thinks that. I think that's, in terms of the halakhlis of a shul, I think that that's something that's very important to keep in mind. Halacha, the source number two, is a piece from the Shulchan Aruch in the Laws of Tzedakah. And here, uh, this is a little uh, halacha that's a little bit historically time bound. The Shulchan Aruch says that a Gabbai Tzedakah ain mekablin mehanashimu mehavadim mehatinokos, ela davar muat, avalo davar gavo. The Gabbai should only accept small gifts from women, children, and servants, not large ones. Now, historically, we're talking about a time when women did not have financial independence and they were counting on their husbands who controlled the money. So in that case, if a woman or a child or a, a servant who don't have independent funds show up to the fundraiser, to the gabai, and they hand him money, large sums of money, so should he accept it or not? Shulchan Aruch says absolutely not. It's not their money. If a kid walks in, a 10-year-old walks in, 
and he's a very religious kid, and he walks up to the rabbi and says, I'd like to make a $10,000 donation, and he hands it to the rabbi in cash. It's ridiculous, right? The rabbi can't take it. Now, he wants to do a mitzvah. Can't take it. That should be obvious. Why? Sheikh has kaso, gazol, oganav, mishal achirim. In the bowl, because they're presumed stolen. Forget Danakov's chus. Look at the facts. This kid's 10 years old. Where's he going to come up with a $1,000 from? You have to look at the facts. Presumed it's stolen or taken from others. Kamahu davar mua. So what technically is a small gift? Everything is dependent on the wealth of the person. And this is only in general, but if the person refuses, even a small gift is prohibited to accept. Meaning, if a father says to the rabbi, to the gabai, the person who controls the funds of the shul, don't take money from my son, you can't accept the money, period, because you assume that all the money the kid has came from his father, and you can't take it. It doesn't matter how big, how small. If not, the kid wants to drop 25 cents, you can assume it came from his allowance. It's not a big deal. That's a shulchan aruch. There is a chazaka. If you know someone does not have rights to that money, there's no way that they came to it legally, cannot take it. Source number three and source number four are an extension of this, which I think is very fascinating. Um, the Noda Yehuda was an 18th century uh, rabbinic scholar in Europe, and he has a couple of different things that he wrote, but one of them is he published his responsa. And here we find a question of his relating to this issue. And the basics of the case, which are there in the text, is that you have a woman who's married to a wealthy man. And this wealthy person does not like giving any charity. But he has lots of money. And whenever he is out of town, I'm paraphrasing, his wife writes big checks. All the guys in town that need money come when the husband's out of town, and the wife feels bad, so she gives them all tzedakah. So the question came to another rabbi who was writing this to the Nur Huda, what do I tell my gabai tzedakah? Can I tell him that it's acceptable to take money from this woman? The guy's got millions of dollars in the bank. He's not shelling out a thing. And his wife feels bad. She wants to help out. But the Shulchan Aruch says that if she doesn't have control over the money, she doesn't have the right to do it. So if you'll, uh, you can see in the second paragraph in the English, he says, you've decided beautifully that God forbid you shouldn't accept from her and it's pure theft. 100% Geza. Even though... He points out that the courts force people to give tzedakah, nonetheless, who made her the judge? Even the court cannot take without his awareness, rather they must inform him and take collateral before him against his will, but without his knowledge it's theft. We have a rule that tzedakah, that charity, can be forcibly taken from people in the community. The, the rabbis in the community, according to the Gemara of Basra, have the right to assess people's financial situations, to assess the needs of those who are less fortunate, and to demand that everyone in the community shell out a certain amount of money towards whatever the cause may be. Proportional to the amount of money that they make, the rabbis have that ability. So what the question we're grappling with here is this woman's husband is not fulfilling his obligation. He's the richest guy in town and he doesn't give a penny. So, yeah, the wife is going behind her husband's back and she really shouldn't be doing it and if he knew he wouldn't be happy, but what percentage is she giving out? Five percent. It's for sure reasonable. This guy's got enough money he can afford it. He says it doesn't matter. When we say that the courts can come in and force someone, that means they can knock on the door and they say, listen, the rabbis have decided that you need to participate can't go behind the guy's back. Question gets a little more interesting, and he says, even what entered your mind that it would be permissible when she was pregnant to distribute to the poor to daven for her, which is interesting, I don't know if that was the minhag, so this is also unacceptable, and it's not part of the refua, it's not part of the healing. Only if the entire family had this custom could you claim it was the obligation of the husband, and then we could force him, but we still can't do anything without his knowledge. So this woman was also saying, if I give money to the poor, they'll daven for me, my pregnancy will be a lot smoother, it'll be healthy. So maybe that's a legitimate concern. He says, absolutely not. Same issue. If you are obligated, if the husband had, the woman came into the marriage with the expectation that her husband would give charity on her behalf, so then she can take him to court and make the court demand that he pay. But she can't be taken out of his wallet when he's not looking. And those who disagree, he concludes, 
and allowed this are supporting sinners. They're mafsik yidei obre avira, and words like this are not even worthy of a response, which is a very powerful end to the letter. So, do you want to make the argument that the wife is helping her husband do the mitzvah that he's not doing? What's the counter argument? I'm even thinking of like with Abraham, no. Who was it? Is it Sephora who gave a bris to Moshe's son? Yeah. Because he wasn't doing it? And it was his obligation to do it. Right. So, first of all, okay, it's a valid point. She did, it didn't cost Moshe a penny. She's doing his mitzvah with his money. True. That. Fair enough. And again, mitzvah baba avira, maybe. She's stealing from her husband to give the tzedakah. Well, I'm thinking, I mean, if they're two half souls and they have reward in the world to come together, then are they really separate or is one unit that's doing the mitzvah? So apparently not. Apparently not. That's the first thing. Now, source number four is the Arach HaSholchan, who came a little bit later than the Rebbe and he disagrees. He says that she has the right to do it. But it's a technical point. Uh, I listened to this... I saw. I didn't know about this Arach HaSholchan. I listened to a share from Rabbi Kenneth Banzer from Yeshiva University, and he quoted it following the Note of Yehuda. So I put it on the sheets as well. He says, therefore, the Arach HaSholchan writes in Source 4, if a rich man is stingy and his wife gives tzedakah without his knowledge, surely she cannot be the judge of this. You see what he's responding to. However, if the rabbi of the city says to her that according to his wealth, if we were able, we would force him to pay the given, uh, a given amount, she can give that amount. What well, the issue he's saying is that in Europe, in the United States, in Canada nowadays, the rabbinic courts don't have the power to come in and force people to pay. So the rabbis of the town can assess that the money that she's giving is reasonable, and then if she gives it, they can keep it. Why? Because they don't have the option of forcing. If they did have the option, then either the rabbis would coerce him into giving or they wouldn't. But now that they don't have the option, you'll see he says, let's keep it. Why should we lose out from what's not within our power to force if we can draw out the tzedakah, which he's obligated in by law? Even though coercion must be with his knowledge, and here he's unaware, since he's obligated, but we can't force, nonetheless it's upon him and we adjudicate according to his obligation. In the situation where one is forced, they still get the mitzvah? Absolutely. Yes, no question. Different, by the way, than truma. We're talking about the contrast to our parsha. There was no coercion if someone didn't want to give truma. Just that it comes up an issue here. So there's a machlokus here between the Nodah Behuda source three and our Hashokan source four about what powers we can take into our own hands, considering that we don't have the judicial power that we would like in a in a Jewish society. So the Nodah Behuda says that it's not within our power, and the Aruch Hashokan says that it. It is to be considering the situation. But everyone agrees in principle that she doesn't have the right to say this is somebody else's money but they really should be giving it so I'm going to take it and, and give it away. If you suspect that a person is doing that, that money is completely gezel, gamor, it's for sure considered theft and it's unacceptable to take that for charitable purposes. Unacceptable. Or to take the wife's money? No, well, the husband's money if it's not hers. All the money in the family is considered the husband's? So, again, to, to clarify, that, historically that's true. Historically that was true. This is a, a, the halakhic issue of what the relationship financially between husbands and wives is, is a little bit tricky, but at the end of the day, the wife is an independent person and she does have the right to demand independent finances from her husband, which is how society functions nowadays. Husbands and wives that have they're both working, the separate checking accounts, things like that is perfectly legitimate. Historically, that wasn't the case. If the wife wasn't working and the husband was in control of the funds and she was taking his money without his permission, technically that's considered gaza. So, like I said, practically in our times, that's not going to be the perfect model. Again, this is one of those cases. It's not going to work because it's not going to be theft because it's probably going to be her portion of the money or it's going to be her money entirely. It's the not, principle remains the same. But the principle of Gezel remains the same, that if you were to take someone else's money because you felt that they deserved to be given to Dukkha and they didn't want to, it's unacceptable for the poor person or for the shul or whoever to accept that money. But again, the, the case is no longer applicable. And you find that in Shulchan Aruch. I should just be clear. I'm not saying that on my own. If you look in the commentaries on Shulchan Aruch, they say that nowadays that's not true. 
It's just a historical fact. Whose mitzvah is it? The husband's, the wife's, both of them? So how does the wife fulfill her mitzvah of tzedakah? So maybe you would go back to that point from before, that there, there would be some kind of relationship between the two, that he gives tzedakah for both of them. We talk about that. He's not giving tzedakah, but she's not getting a mitzvah. But that doesn't give her the right, that's a point, but she, that doesn't give her the right to steal the money. That's exactly the point. Right. Tough relationship, I agree. I call it stealing the money, though. I mean, Black on white. Right. It's a difficult because you're twisting that woman's. You're, you are twisting her arm. Absolutely. But it, that's not. Th- th- but if, if some of these examples. Let, this, uh, this is a great point because some of these examples are black on white. Some of these examples are easy. The guy is a, is a thief. He's a bank robber. And now he wants to move to Mexico and build a shul. So everyone says you, know, you shouldn't accept money from that person, right? But when a woman in a historical setting who didn't have control over her finances comes in and she, and this is the, exactly the Nordic Behuda's issue, she says, listen, I can't, I want to give tzedakah, I'm pregnant, I feel like this is a big schuss for me to be giving that money, so now it becomes more of a gray area. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly, I think that's what's great about this point of the Nordic Behuda, he says you have to look at it, you know, strictly by the letter of the law. Is she stealing from her husband or is she not? If legally it's considered stealing, can't take the money. What about her personal desire to give tzedakah that's very admirable, but not at the expense of the Isser of Geneva? Some cases are trickier than others. I think, I, you know, now, the Aruch HaShulchan doesn't agree with me so much. It kind of depends on the situation. Yeah, she's taking it without his permission, but really tzedakah can be forced on people. And so suppose yeah. they're not, what's that? You mean? If the wife's working on it's not. Yeah, that's true. It would be true, and now it would be the same thing. Right? If the wife's the one who's making the money and she doesn't want to give, and the husband is dropping money at school in the morning, it would be the same thing. It's true. But I, I don't know the Karen's question is, does, does a male and female both have the same 10% um, obligation with respect to stuff? It's interesting. I think so. But then again, if she doesn't have income, she doesn't have a percentage. Right. If you don't, ha- if you don't, don't have an income, you don't have a fee of tzedakah, I don't think. I don't so think so. Because I'm just thinking about man's obligation to learn woman's obligation to help her husband learn but not to learn itself. I, mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering whether there's a dual role and if the wife's not earning an income, she also doesn't have the mitzvah of giving tzedakah. There is a mitzvah, should, there is a mitzvah to give tzedakah even for people that don't have money. The Shulchan Aruch quotes, if you don't have money, you should, you should get tzedakah and give tzedakah. Everyone's supposed to be giving charity when they can. But obviously, in, in a, the, the wife, the husband-wife relationship, it's going to be tzedakah for the both I think that that's a reasonable assumption. You're only talking about giving money or what about giving your time, volunteering. Absolutely, that. right. But then we get into the issue of are we talking about technically fulfilling the mitzvah of tzedakah in the Torah? Or are we talk, depending on what exactly that mitzvah is, not so clear, uh, versus doing acts of chesed and where chesed fits in with tzedakah. That's that, right, it's a complicated issue. But here she was, and that's what the Nodim Judah was getting at this point with what is her expectation coming into the marriage? Her expectation is that her husband is going to be a decent person and he's going to be giving this money so she can take him to court and say, we as a family need to be giving tzedakah and we're not, and the court will force him to give the money. That's true here. That's true here too. Right, assuming that, the, oh, again, there's a religious court in, in place. She has the right to say, my husband's not giving his mice money and it's, it's, it's a bad school law for me. That's bad No question. I remember that... Um, Dr. David Kalkovitz, who's a psychologist in New York, he teaches classes at YU. So he gave like this this um, this discussion. He had this discussion on dating, and I forget exactly the term that he used, but he talked about major issues and minor issues when you're dating. And one of his examples was if a major issue is if a, a one one party wants to give tons of charity and the other doesn't want to give it all. If you're the kind of person who always wants to be giving and you're dating someone who never wants to give, that's a major issue. If the question is 10% or 15%, shuls or schools, that's a minor issue. I remember, but he said that's something people should be talking about. But the, but the court recognizes that as a perfectly legitimate claim. I'm taking care of your house, you're the one who's making the money, and now you have to shell some of it out to help the community. That's something that we both need. It's legit, that's legitimate. Okay. Source number five is a Gemara in Bavakama, really a Mishnah and a Gemara in Bavakama. And here we have an interesting case. Here we have 
Hagozelas Aviv in Nishbal over A person who steals from his father and he swears falsely that he didn't steal, which adds to his obligation because he swore falsely in court. Vamace, and then the father dies. So he's obligated to pay Mishal and Karen Chomish Bashan the Banaval Akiv. So he has to pay the he has to pay pay uh, the Karen has to be the amount that he stole plus an extra fifth to the sons of the person his father, meaning his brothers, or Achiv to his uncles. Vim Eno wrote Zeus Eno, what if he doesn't want to pay it from that money? Lava Ubalichu of Bain Vin So you have a little bit of a tricky case here. Person steals from his father, swears falsely about it, so now he needs to pay 120% of the value according to Halakha. And he, the father passes away. So we have a mitzvah, when a person steals, they have a mitzvah of hashava, just like you have hashava sabida, you also have hashava sagzeva. You have a mitzvah to return what you stole. Now, practically, he can't return it to his father. So if there are inheritors other than himself, so he can return it to them because they're the ones who are the rightful owners of that money now and that would be the equivalent. Technically if he doesn't want to and he wants to use different monies that's the issue the mission is grappling with. But if you turn to the second side of the sheet on the top the Gemara continues there. Amr of Yosef, of Yosef says, Afilu la'arniki shal tzedakah. He could give the money to charity assuming there are no relatives and her papa says, Bitzarek sheyomer ze gezel ad. He has to say, this is the money that I stole from my father. So I would make two points from this statement in the Gemara. My first point, I mean, I guess we'll say it as a question. The guy steals. And now he has a mitzvah to return what he stole and he feels bad about it, but there's no one to return it to. So the Gemara says, send it, give it to charity. So what about our mitzvah habal badeira issue? What about giving tzedakah from tainted funds? Apparently that's not an issue. I think you see that right away. Better to give it to tzedakah than to keep it and not fulfill his mitzvah. Okay. What about this second line? Rav Papa says, V'tzarach sheyomer zeh gezel avi. Now he has to say the truth. He has to say, this comes from my father's money. This isn't really mine. So, in source six, we have an interesting, very long letter from Rav Moshe Feinstein, which here we only have a small segment of it. And Rav Moshe received a letter, which I think is very fascinating for a number of reasons, from a person who was a person who was not religious and involved, I think, in a lot of, it seems like, in some criminal activity. And in the process of coming back to religion, one of the obstacles that this person faced, among others, was he had money that he had stolen and he wasn't sure what to do with it. So in his letter, he writes to Rav Moshe, I have this money, and I've stolen from a number of people, and I don't know, I, I, this is something, this was part of my life, and I just don't know what to do with this money, but I feel like my chuba won't be complete without dealing with it. So Rav Moshe gives the guy a bracha that he should be successful, and when it comes to the money issue, so Rav Moshe cites our Gemara, and he says, you've got to give the money away to charity if you can't figure out who it belongs to. But, says Rav Moshe, there is a condition to giving this money to tzedakah. Obviously, he says, you must give in such a way that they know not to credit you or give you honor, that they should think that you have fulfilled your obligation. If you give in a way that they do credit you and they give you honor as a result, you haven't fulfilled your obligation of returning the theft. What's going to happen? The guy's a thief. He donates big money to the shul. And now when he comes to the shul, everybody's respecting him and he's always getting an aliyah and all these things, right? So he's misleading everybody. He's taking advantage of this money even while he's giving it away. And he's not allowed to have that benefit. Ramosha says next, if you give on the condition that you should receive an aliyah, surely you haven't fulfilled your obligation. This doesn't even work to be excused of a veil. If a person says, I promise $150 to the shul. And then the next time he gets an aliyah, they give him the Misha Beirach and he does $150. So that's not the same $150. $150 for the aliyah is totally different than the 150 no strings attached. This doesn't even work to be excused of a vow. If you've been promised previously and now you're pledging the same money upon receiving an aliyah, 
thinking you'll pay the, bed, the, the, the pledge, these are words in your heart and you're responsible to pay twice the commitment. The guy gets an aliyah and he says, I'll give $150 because he stole $150 and now he needs to give it to the shul. So he's going to have to pay $300. That's what Moshe says. So it's interesting because on the one hand we see here that putting the money into charity at the, when everything is done is not the worst thing in the world. We don't say the shul is built on dirty money. Things happen. There's no way to get the money back to the rightful owner. So giving it to the charity is perfectly reasonable. But don't fool yourself. That's not an excuse to use that money to credit your generosity. And I think that's an important factor. Going back to the issue, I'm still, I'm still, I wish I could find someone that talked about this. The issue of once the name is on the wall, what do you do in that situation? I think that's probably the most difficult of all of our scenarios. I think it's very tricky. Are you committed to keeping that person's name on the wall. He gives the money on the condition that he's going to get a certain amount of honor for it, and they name the building after the major donor. And now the major donor turns out to be a criminal. The money was never his. So even if you make the argument that the synagogue doesn't have to pay them and take out a loan to find out whose money was and pay it back, and it's that it's not the synagogue's fault, are they bound to keep his name on the wall? Should they take it down? If he knew from the start, what you see from this chuba, if he knew from the start that the money wasn't his, he had no right to ask the opposite. He, he can't and he shouldn't ask or allow any honors to be given to him as a result. There's no dinner, there's no name on the wall, there's no anything. But now it's already up on the wall and the guy is in prison. Well, then he has to pay. He's got to, He's got to pay it again. Double, he, double, that's double. interesting, maybe, maybe. Good luck with that from prison. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it depends on the case. But, but do, do you assume, that, can you make the assumption that this money was never this person's? As a Jewish organization, as a synagogue, the money is here, the money can stay. But it wasn't his, who are we fooling? You put his name up on the wall, but it's not really his money to be given out. I was talking to some guys in, the, in our kollel this week about this topic, trying to hear what everyone had to say. And I won't get too specific, but an organization that I'm very familiar with apparently dealt with an issue that's, a, again, the variables are always going to be different. But I was a little bit shocked because it turned out that a person who gives significant, significant funds to a number of very large Jewish organizations in the, in the U.S., probably in Canada and in Israel, was found to be involved in the trade of arms in Mexico. Now, this is a person who is still giving, who is being honored. Now, let me clarify this. I'm not sure what he's doing is illegal. Mm -hmm. And we could, again, take that next step to the doing business with China, having your products made in China and underpaid, uh, underpaid, underprivileged workers. You could go that step, also go that route. I don't know exactly, but I do know that there is one organization in Israel whose Rosh Yeshiva it was brought to their attention that this is what the person was making his money from and the Rosh Hashiva said no more money from them. Now their name is on the wall and I think it remains on the wall and they're welcome to come and visit the etc etc but they've asked them to stop making donations. Now that's a very noble thing to do and I'm not so sure that they have to because again is this stolen, is this an ethical issue versus a legal issue maybe everything they're doing is within the law I don't know. But he's not under arrest. What about? Right. No, 100%. No, he's, he's, yeah. Yeah. So. You said, you said if they're in jail. Not, right, not necessarily. No, there's, there's a gentleman that's in jail right now that stole a million dollars. Yeah. 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 Y
where legally it's his money. He sold it fair and square. He's, in, I think, he's entitled to have his products produced in a country that doesn't treat its workers by what we would consider ethical standards, but that's the law. He's following the law and he's doing well with it. And now he's turning around and dropping 20% to charity. It's also doing a nice thing. Well, what about someone that makes the money selling like trade food? So the tree food issue can be a little tricky when it comes to milk and meat, for example. Milk and meat you're not allowed to derive benefit from specifically. So for a person to sell it, even if they're not eating it, it would be forbidden for them to provide to benefit from it, to sell it for profit, and then the, I don't know what would happen. What would the status of that money would be? I don't know. One area where this discussion comes up, and this is where maybe we'll shift to the the question of the, the synagogue itself being of a higher standard than other areas in the Jewish community is, didn't make the sheets, I apologize. The Torah addresses uh, prostitution explicitly. And it specifically, in the, when it comes to donations to the Beis Hamikdash for sacrifices, for karbonos. And the Torah says that a woman who was, was paid for her services cannot bring the animal that she was given as payment, as a sacrifice, in the Beis HaMikdash. And even if it's maybe changed hands, even if it no longer, if it, if it was, there are permutations of the case, but the Torah says specifically, is forbidden to bring the payment of a prostitute into the, the temple of Hashem. So, that I was surprised to find, if you look in the laws of the shul, in the Hilfos Beis HaKnesses, in the Shulchan Aruch, there's actually a statement of the Ramah and his commentary on the Shulchan Aruch that extends that not only from the Temple Mount itself, but to every synagogue, which is we refer to as times as like a Mikdash Ma'at. But uh, even you know, from a legal perspective, he actually believed that. He says, Asr Lasos. It's forbidden to take the wages of a prostitute and to turn that money around into do a donation for a synagogue or for the writing of a Sefer Torah. That's only true, legally, if she is donating the payment itself. She's donating the car she was given, then you can't use that. Aval if she's paid in cash and the cash is in dirty funds and she wants to take the cash and buy something with it, she can do that. The Torah specifically says she can't use the wage, but if, if it was cash, it wouldn't be a big deal. So she gets money, she can use that money to charge the official. So it's interesting. I would think it's only if the money has like turned over. Um, if she, for example, were to receive something, as wages, a car, and sell the car. So that money is perfectly acceptable. Which is really interesting. She could donate the car, but she could sell the car. Exactly. Right. Not the car, but the cash would be fine. And That's what Mr. Bura says here. It's always referring to sheep. Right. Right. So. What happened to the heat? Traditional. Traditional. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That's what it was. That's why it's related to the time. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Probably it was times, some. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Even maybe by the Shulchan Aruch times. Maybe, right? I mean, in the in, we know in Greek society, it's legitimate. Historically, it's a legitimate question. The Gemara has those tragic stories about the brother and the sister, and there's. Uh, they, they, I mean, there were things. There definitely were. What What I found very interesting when I looked into this is the Prima Gadim in his commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. He asks the question, for the Mangan Avram states explicitly, this is a rabbinic decree, this is a Dindar Why is that? The Torah explicitly says that the woman cannot donate her, her wages to the base Hamegdash. So what about donating to a shul? You can't tell me that the Torah prohibits that. That's not what the Torah is talking about. So apparently, the Rabbanan, the rabbis, instituted that the same standards that apply biblically to the temple should apply rabbinically to the shul. So it's not the same level prohibition. It's still prohibited, but it's only rabbinic. There could be ramifications that result from that, but that may be too complicated for this discussion. 
But if you wanted to give this money to like a Jewish school, so the pre exactly. So the pre Magadim comes along and he says, okay, Sefer Torah, I get it. Sefer Torah belongs from the shul. The, the shul itself, I get it. That's like a temple. It's a mikdash ma'at. I can understand that argument. What about a talis, he says. What about use the money to buy a pair of tefillin for her son? Well, I know an example of uh, right there in Thorn Hill of a family and questionable source of income. And it was, they were giving a lot of money to a shul, and the shul turned the money away. But they gave it to a school who was very happy to get it. So I, I also wonder about the relationship between the Beis HaKnesses and the Yeshiva, the place where people learn in some, as, in some regards has a higher level of Kiddusha, of spirituality, than a shul. So I'm not so sure, but the Prima Gadam's question to me was very fascinating. Do we say that this is a strict biblical law that applies to the temple? The rabbis extended that to shuls and that's it? And beyond that it's okay or not? But you see that, again, there are limitations to technically, is this tainted funds? The wages which she received themselves are tainted, but not if she exchanges them for something else. She's not a person who you can't accept things from. You just have to make sure that these aren't the funds themselves that she receives. Direct funds. Exactly. Direct funds. But if she receives cash, that's fine. So it seems, it seems like it is, although I'm not exactly sure why. So if she, if she, I mean, the Ramah says, "Im mutter and par mitzvah." If she was given money, it's fine. Again, because the Torah specifically states animals. If she's given an object as her as her wages, so that she can't give over. So maybe the rule just doesn't apply to money in general. We don't assume that money is so identifiable that these are the specific funds which money is money. She has a hundred dollars cash in her wallet. It doesn't matter which dollar bills were which. Accepting her money in any case legitimizes her lifestyle. So that's the other issue that comes up here. Apparently, that's not true. No. I mean, you, you, you're entitled to accept money from this person. You don't have to assume that every penny she owns is a result of her profession, okay. which is interesting because when you go back to the case of the child who's donating money, you assume that any penny that he has is probably taken from his father's wallet. Yeah. Maybe as a paper wrap. Who knows, right? Yeah. It is possible. So how, how much you have to assume, I think, is also up for grabs here. I could hear you saying, I don't want to put that person's name on my wall because we all know what she does for a living. But I don't know if you have to refuse. I don't, it appears that you do not have to refuse that money. You're talking about writing a safer Torah with the cash that she got for selling the car. We're not talking about you know, a little bit of money towards the building fund. We're talking about a Torah here. But again, is there a higher standard for the shul? Maybe yes, maybe no. It doesn't depend on the amount then. So when Sefer Torah says a large amount, then you can go into something smaller, then then it's okay. Yeah. So I I would just I'll end this topic, and we'll do another thing on the parsha. We'll end this topic with with two more words, which I thought was very beautiful. I saw regarding an issue again that is slightly different, but I think relevant to the topic. I saw a tshuva. Um, that was written by that was written by the Minchas Yitzchak, who is a, a, a die and a judge in, in Eretz Yisrael in Israel right now, and he was asked regarding fundraisers for shuls that do not abide with all the halachic standards that they should. And is it acceptable? Is it not acceptable? And obviously, what are you going to hear from the people? Come on, Rabbi, it's for the shul. So in his response, where he says that it's absolutely unacceptable to do that, he quotes an interesting medrash, which will be relevant in a few weeks, when Moshe goes to Har Sinai, and he accepts the Ten Commandments the first time. God tells him, you should go back down, ki shichei samcha, because your people have sinned. And it's very interesting that it appears in the Psukim that Moshe did not believe God. And when Moshe gets down, he's a little bit surprised that he catches the people red-handed. So the Medrash asks the obvious question. If God tells you what's going on at the foot of the mountain, you should probably trust him. This is Moshe Rabbeinu. He doesn't think God's accurate. Maybe God overlooked it. He you know, judged too quickly. So the Medrash goes from there to explain that Moshe was teaching us a lesson that you can't judge people until you see it with your own eyes, etc., etc. But if you look at the Pasuk, when Moshe comes down the mountain, 
It says, Vayares ho'igelu mecholos. Moshe saw the, the golden calf, and he saw the dancing. And what Dayan Weiss writes is that Moshe didn't just see the sin. It's not that he just caught them red-handed, but that there are sins that people do that they're embarrassed about. There are sins that they do with their shades down, with the doors closed. That's not so bad. He said, if Moshe would have thought that God caught them when they, they didn't think anybody was watching, he would come back and they would talk about it and they would fix it. But he walked back to a society that he thought he knew, and out in the public, you have a party. They're celebrating this new religious experience, and no one's embarrassed about it. Aaron HaKohen is there, and no one's embarrassed. And that's when Moshe broke the luchos when he realized that they were embracing this and there was no shame. And what Diane Weiss writes is specifically when it comes to fundraisers for shuls and for schools and Jewish organizations that are attempting to contribute spiritually to the community, the effect of saying it's not so bad and it's worth it for a fundraiser is catastrophic. 